Uh, my name is Kent Salmon. Uh, I'm a member of the Kiowa tribe of Oklahoma, but I'm also a uh, Chickasaw. Both of my grandparents were original Alates, uh, so uh, they were born before the state of Oklahoma even existed. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess that's, uh, so I grow corn. Uh, I guess that's why I'm here talking today. You know, I was the, the uh, kind of the way this whole thing started was just talking to, I'd sent uh, Elizabeth over a summer, I'd sent her a bunch of pictures of the stuff that I was growing over time. And so it kind of got to this whole deal about uh, Chickasaw corn and uh, particularly this uh, red corn that I grow and sort of the background on that. Uh, and, you know, kind of one of the questions that kind of came up was this whole issue about the cultural significance of that. And I was like, well, there's a lot to that. Uh, so I'll try to uh, kind of, first of all, I guess, kind of talk about a little bit about my involvement with it and also this, the kind of the history of this corn. Uh, so, you know, I, I, you know, when I was growing up, I, I grew up in Tulsa, uh, pretty much, uh, you know, had a fairly uh, white suburban middle class upbringing, all that sort of stuff. Um, and actually most of my connections with native uh, stuff was with the Kiowas. Like I said, you know, my grandmother was a uh, Kiowa, she spoke Kiowa, was a member of the, you know, tribal government, all that stuff. I was down in Mears all the time. Uh, in my, uh, you know, my uh, grandmother and her sisters were all pretty strong personalities. And so my grandfather had a pretty strong personality of his own, but he kind of tended to get, uh, you know, I don't want to say sidetracked, but uh, <laughs> You know, he was he was stuck down in mirrors around a bunch of uh, in a Kiowa family with a bunch of uh, Kiowa women. So he uh, so I kind of picked up all the Kiowa stuff, not the Chickasaw stuff. Um, and then I spent some time in uh, Southeast Asia. I kind of very early on developed an interest in a country, the country of Burma, and um, was in South and ended up at one point after I finished a degree at Oklahoma State University, uh, ended up uh, volunteering with the. Uh, Episcopal and Presbyterian Church and ended up in Southeast Asia uh, and spent a lot of time there uh, with basically the tribal and ethnic groups out of Burma, which that would be a whole topic. Then I still maintain those. But uh, after that, I kind of came back to the U.S. and I was like, well, you know, spent that time there and learned a lot. Uh, but I'm also kind of need to get back to the you know native communities here. And particularly, I thought, you know, I really don't know that much about the Chickasaw stuff. Most of what I know is really more Kiowa. And just after I'd gotten back, there was an article in uh, Oklahoma Today magazine, and it was about a gentleman named Carl Barnes, who has uh, since passed on. But Carl was uh, lived in Turpin, Oklahoma, and Carl was probably the one guy that had did the most to preserve a lot of old open pollinated corn varieties, uh, and commercial, but also a lot of native varieties. And Carl had this extensive collection, I think. That collection is actually up now up north and on the uh, on Onondaga, and so the Onondaga are conserving that. But I think he ended up with like, you know, fifteen hundred different corn varieties and about five hundred bean varieties, and all that stuff's up there. But anyway, I was reading this article and I was like, well, that's interesting. So I contacted him after I read the article and said, hey, by the way, do you happen to have any Chickasaw corn? He's like, oh yeah, I happen to have a variety. So he sent me that corn and I grew it. Uh, during this time, I also started kind of going down to you know, the Chickasaw Nation, uh, met Linda Galvin, who at that time was uh, working for the uh, Cultural Resources Center for the Chickasaw Nation and started making some contacts down there. And then um, one year, you know, it was actually, I guess it was 19, maybe 1993, I went down to the Chickasaw Festival and I was sitting there with Glenda and this older gentleman came up and started talking to Glenda and he said something and I was like, I kind of realized like, wait a minute, this guy's got you know, some old corn varieties. And so he kind of walked off and, and kind of said, hey, Glenda, who is that uh, older man? And did I understand right that he's got, you know, some Chickasaw varieties? And said, oh, yeah, that's uh, Morgan Wells. And so I ended up running after him and chasing him down and uh, introduced myself. And I was like, you know, uh, you actually have some, you know, old varieties. And he was like, oh, yeah. Uh, it was stuff that he had gotten from his grandfather who had grown it prior to statehood down what was then called Wells Valley, but now it's called Bromide, Oklahoma. And uh, his grandfather had been a commercial farmer, basically. I think he had around 2,000 acres of farm and ranch land uh, and really had pretty extensive business connections. He, I forget it was either Kansas City or St. Louis that he went up to on a regular business, I mean, basis because of his uh, business connections. And he basically grew 
Reed's Yellow Dent and Ferguson's Yellow Dent, which were, this is back before they were hybrid or GMO, but these were commercially available corn seeds. And that was what he grew most of the time. But he had these two varieties that even then apparently were kind of heirloom varieties, and that is why he grew them. Uh, they'd kind of been passed down. And Morgan wasn't sure if they'd been brought over during removal, but he thought they were, and there were definitely Chickasaw names for them. And one of them, actually the one here is, I don't know if you can see that, but this is a, the red corn that, I, that Morgan's grandfather had. Uh, and here's another ear of it. And you can see it also has these really distinctive uh, husks. And then the other variety he had was this uh, yellow corn. So basically I got those and really been growing them ever since, um, since that time. And so, um, you know, one of the questions and kind of the discussion and lead up to doing this Zoom, one of the questions was on the, you know, the cultural significance of this corn. And, you know, one of the things I think about, you know, it's, it's a pretty important question, really, uh, you know, what is the cultural significance of this corn? And not just this corn, I would say, but, you know, the, all the different varieties, the, the traditional varieties that are out there. Um, and, you know, I think, I guess kind of the basic answer is everyone is, rightfully concerned about preserving the traditions and the language and all of that. But really there was a foundation for all, all of that. Um, you know, and it was the food. And, you know, if there wasn't anything to eat, there wouldn't have been any of the culture or anything. So this, you know, the kind of the cultural significance of these crops is that allowed people to survive. That was what the, you know, the basis was. Um, and, you know, when we're kind of looking, especially in, you know, the aftermath of the McGirt decision and everyone talking about tribal sovereignty and, you know, reestablishing and revitalizing our tribal nations, you know, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, criminal and civil jurisdiction, uh, about taxes and all those sorts of things. And those are all very important, relevant things, but there's a foundation beneath all of that, that all of those things rely on. You know, and that is the culture, that is the language, uh, that is the traditions, but it's also that food. Um, you know, in, in, you know in, the, in the course of this pandemic, I've heard stories, you know, it's all anecdotal, but, um, you know, about some of the tribal elders when they were sending them food boxes or things like this during the pandemic, that they were getting expired frozen hot dogs. And you're like, okay, well then, if we're having to feed our elders with expired frozen hot dogs, then how are we sovereign exactly? <laughs> you know, what does this sovereignty actually mean to us if that's the case? All these other things are nice, but we're not even in a position where we can feed our own people, basically. Um, and so that kind of, you know, that's sort of one of the cultural significances of, of that is to try to bring that back. Um, and I, I'd say a couple other things. One of the, um, you know, this year, um, you know, well, I guess it's since it's Veterans Day, my uh, father was a World War II pilot. Uh, he was a, a co-pilot on a B-17. Uh, he was not in the Air Force. He was in the Army Air Force. There was no Air Force when my father was in the military, but uh, he passed away this August. Um, and so this year I did plant some of the red corn, but I didn't grow a whole lot of it, uh, basically because I was busy. You know, my father, he fortunately, you know, passed away at home in his sleep. Uh, so, you know, it was kind of busy taking care of him. So I wasn't able to do a lot of other things and don't regret that at all. But, you know, that was just, wasn't able to do a lot of the things, other things that I wanted to do. Uh, so what happened this year was a friend of mine, or a couple of friends of mine, Tom and Caitlin actually grew a lot of this red corn this year. And, you know, Caitlin's Caddo. Uh, and, you know, there's a couple of things about that. Uh, you know, again, one of the things is I think uh, with a lot of these corn varieties, you know, um, a lot of times, I, you know, we get, a, oh, this is a Chickasaw corn. Well, I'm not really sure that it is. I mean, Morgan wasn't entirely clear where his family had gotten it from originally. So it could have been something that they got after removal. So maybe, maybe they'd gotten it from the Wichita's or the Chickasaw's had relationships going back a long time ago. But even if it was a Chickasaw corn, I don't think that this is a corn that was exclusively grown by the Chickasaw. Uh, you know, the tribes had extensive contacts for thousands of years. Uh, you know, Day and I have had some text uh, conversations about the trading relationships between the Southern Plains and the Pueblos. And also even, you know, uh, she was talking about the relationships between the Pueblos and the California tribes and the influences from 
uh, you know, from further south, from Mexico and Central America, uh, that still extent in, you know, that culture. And, uh, you know, at the beginning of September, went down to uh, Spiro Mounds, you know, that archaeological site, and was talking to one of the archaeologists there. And, you know, there are, um, they find trade goods that were brought in from the Pacific and also from the East Coast. And there's also stuff from both North and South as well. So, you know, as I kind of like to say, our our ancestors in a lot of ways were much more cosmopolitan than we are these days. I mean, they really had a very wide ranging con you know, uh, context. And so I think a lot of these corn varieties aren't just, I don't think that this Chickasaw corn was grown just by Chickasaws as it were. This is just who happens to have the seeds right now. And so that when my friend Caitlin grew it, I don't think that that was a, uh, don't think that was the first time a Caddo woman had grown this corn. I think in a lot of ways, this is sort of returning to back to how, what was the norm in the past. Um, but also that thing to, about the women, I, you know, again, I think uh, you know, like if they had mentioned, there was a, it wasn't just this corn, there was an entire system, an entire economic system, a whole land management, you know, system. And that the critical part of that was, you know, the women. Um, and, you know, when we think about that, that's a very, very big deal, really, because the way that tribal societies were structured, at least in my opinion, and this would even include like the Kiowas who were not agricultural, is that women really did have a large say in the overall economies of the tribe, and that that was not an accident, that that was very much um, an intentional thing. And so when you look, and I don't think we kind of think about the implications of that a lot of times. Um, and, you know, how does that, and how should that, um, let's say, how should that influence us going forward in a lot of ways? You know, we kind of should look back to some of that. I mean, the question I always pose is realizing that there's very big differences in, you know, between technology and culture and all that between, say, 1720 and 2020. But at what point do you think Chickasaw women, since we're talking about Chickasaw corn, at what point did Chickasaw women have a higher socioeconomic status? Was it 1720 or 2020? And so if we're looking at this about, okay, well, and po especially kind of post McGirt, we're really gonna, we're gonna revitalize our tribal nations. Um, maybe we should kind of revisit some of those things. And even in terms of like the, you know, the agriculture, and I think that it's very important that we try to bring back these varieties, but also bring it back within the context that you know, like they was saying, there was a whole system. There was an agricultural, frankly, an economic system. And how do we do that? Um, I mean, you know, obviously the easiest way to do that would be to contract a bunch of uh, non-native farmers, commercial farmers already, and, you know, say, hey, grow this stuff for us. But again, those aren't going to be native people, and they're probably not going to be women either. That may be the easiest way, but is that necessarily the best way to bring those things back? and, you know, going forward with that. And so that's, you know, I think in terms of looking at the cultural significance of that, it's not just as simply a matter of planting the seeds in the ground, but actually how do those, who's planting those seeds in the ground, who's maintaining those seeds, who's taking care of them going forward, um, you know, and I realize I'm a guy doing this, but, <laughs> but hopefully we can change that going forward. So, because men have other responsibilities that we should be taking care of. So that's really kind of all I have at this point. Well, thank everybody for coming. Um, we're going to wrap up here. There's so much information, so much to just sit and think about. And even, you know, us here, students, you know, coming up, uh, it really kind of allows us to think about our next steps, you know, how are we going to help our communities and bring some of this back, um, our old ways, and even, you know, these new technologies and these uh, big companies and where are, where we fit in this world, you know, so um, thank everybody for sharing and uh, have a good week. You spoke about um, empowering uh, indigenous women, you know, and um, 
what what can a place maybe like the center uh we're inside of a agriculturally heavy school in Oklahoma, which is very, um, has a high population of native people. Uh, how can a place like this, you know, maybe bridge the gap between these companies who aren't people involved and community involved in indigenous women who a lot of times are the seed bearers, like you said. You know, I would kind of say is, and I'm, I mean, I'm really glad to hear those numbers in forestry, but I, I mean, not in forestry, in, in agriculture. But like I said, I think there's a much broader, there was a whole food system, right? And that included stuff that isn't necessarily agriculture. And in some ways, I think even, you know, this is just my opinion, but, you know, even to kind of talk about it in terms of agriculture, I don't know if those concepts were really there in, you know, a lot of the indigenous systems, or I don't think they broke things down in the same way uh, as we do nowadays. Um, you know, I mean, obviously the tribes were engaged in all sorts of interesting land management, uh, you know, days out there in California, and she could probably talk about this a lot more, but the whole, you know, the oak trees are not a cultivated crop, you know, crop, but the California tribes were, you know, essentially relying on, I guess, what, what would be the term agroforestry to feed themselves, not grain crops necessarily. Uh, or if you look at say even native Hawaiians, you know, there's the breadfruit tree that they were growing, not, you know, but not necessarily, I mean, they had other crops as well, but it was a different, you know, system. And so a lot of these things, even if you're looking at, I, I'd be curious as, at the, you know, native students that are in, in things like forestry, uh, you know, maybe environmental studies, all these, you know, game management, anything related to all those sorts of, of topics. Ranching, obviously, would be another one. But there's a whole kind of raft of things. And I think, you know, I think that that might give a kind of a broader picture of kind of looking at those things, you know, uh, those sorts of things. But I think even some of the broader, you know, kind of looking at it maybe a little bit in a, a broader lens also is, is useful. Uh, and, you know, especially from the standpoint of the university and trying to focus things into um, you know, kind of looking forward at, at food systems in general, just beyond agriculture and horticulture, I guess, is what I would say. What, like, role of technology do you think um, could be coming into, like, the agriculture system? Uh, and what different roles do you think technology could play in, in kind of bringing about the, um, I guess, the cultivation of these, like, programs and putting them putting more students into, you know, being involved with them. Yeah, um, I guess one of the things I kind of back to the, uh, I'll throw out something kind of really kind of off the wall, but uh, back to the, the whole issue of, you know, what's old is new now. Uh, I'll just uh, throw out, there's a book that I uh, read a while back, and I actually, I think uh, you all might be interested in reading at some point. Uh, it's actually written, he's not Aboriginal, but he's a uh, author in, uh, I mean, a, a I think he's actually a geographer in uh, Australia, and the book is called The uh, Greatest Estate on Earth, and it's a in sort of an environmental history of Australia, and it's really pretty amazing because you know, he's got pretty good evidence on this, and I don't think anybody's actually shot this down, but essentially what he is arguing is that the Aborigines had an, an, a continent-wide, remember Australia is a continent, a continent-wide land management system that not only didn't damage the environment, but actually made the environment of Australia better. And that when the net got shut down, um, you know, that kind of caused a lot of the problems. I mean, like, you know, last year with all the brush fire, you know, all the horrible fires in Australia, um, you know, they were kind of pointing out and, you know, what this book sort of argues that they had fire was one of the tools that they used to manage the environment. And then it's like, what he was arguing is like these incredibly complex uh, burn patterns that were used to alter the environment. Uh, and some of which were like on a 300 year time scale. <laughs> so you had to do a prescribed burn every 300 years to get these sort of mosaics of vegetation that were still in the Australian landscape. But that's really the only way, I mean, if you kind of go analyze it, uh, so, I mean, you know, there's this incredibly complex um, environmental management system that was used. Um, and so, you know, and you kind of ask yourself, how did they 
figure that out. <laughs> I mean, that's some serious technology. Uh, may not have had, you know, uh, computers or a lot of these other things. So, I mean, that's something that, I, you know, I'd say that maybe kind of worth looking at, but also kind of back to your point, I guess kind of to kind of follow on some of what Ade was talking about is, you know, I think the issue is not so much, I mean, technology has always been in agriculture. I mean, the plow is a technology, the hoe is a technology, you know, all those things are technology. The question has also always been how to make sure that that technology is equitable and available to everybody. Um, and I think that's sort of the question, and particularly with native communities, I and mean, it is this, this whole, there's this whole history of, you know, trying to limit technology or, you know, you know, in terms of the education and all those sorts of things, not having adequate uh, access to it. And that kind of is, in some ways, is I think also doesn't completely solve, but it's part of that ethical, uh, you know, question that Ade was talking about. I mean, again, who, the ethical question is who gets to make those choices about how that technology is going to be used? Who is it that's going to be it? Is it going to be the tech billionaire or is it going to be the the communities that are that are out there? Um, so, you know, that's sort of the way I think it, I would look at it. 